Partial fractions can be kind of a complicated topic when it comes to integrating functions using partial fractions. Well, recently I talked about this in one of my weekly live streams, which I'm doing every Monday night at five o'clock Pacific. And I thought you might find the portion of that live stream helpful where I talked about the specific example that we're gonna be going over in this video. Now, part of that process is gonna be partial fraction decomposition, but then also taking it a step further and actually integrating those functions. And figuring out which type of partial fraction decomposition method to apply can sometimes be one of the harder parts. So I wanted to show you exactly how you can determine that as a part of the discussion of how to solve the example that we're gonna be going over in this video. If that sounds good to you, be sure to stick around to the end of the video. And if you get some use out of this, please go ahead and hit that like button down below. It's a huge help to my channel. But without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the example and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Evaluate the integral. We're gonna integrate uh, x minus four all over x squared minus five x plus six dx from zero to one. So we can see right off the bat that we have, again, a fraction with polynomials on the top and the bottom of the fraction. So that's a prime, prime kind of sign that we're probably gonna be doing integration by partial fraction or partial fraction integration, which again, is going to have to start out by decomposing, doing the, the actual partial fraction decomposition, like decomposing this fraction into two or more, uh, hopefully easier to integrate fractions. That's kind of the goal. So first thing you want to look at, the degree on the numerator and the degree on the denominator. So right off the bat, we can see the degree, the highest power x on the numerator is one, and the degree from the highest power x on the denominator is two. So the degree on the numerator is less than the degree on the denominator. So we do not need to start with long division in this case. We only need to start with long division if the top, the degree of the top is the same, or if the degree on the top is greater than the degree on the bottom. Since the degree on the top is less than the degree on the bottom, we don't have to worry about that. So we're not gonna need to do long division this time. What we wanna do first of all is think about if this denominator can be factored. Because if it can, that's gonna make this uh, a little bit easier. So first of all, can we factor this denominator? That's obviously not really gonna change what the numerator looks like. So I'm just gonna go ahead and leave the numerator as it is here, x minus four. Now, how can we factor this denominator? What are two numbers that multiply to get positive six and add to get negative five? Well, right off the bat, I can, can think of uh, x minus two and x minus three. If we were to FOIL this out, we would end back up at x squared minus five x plus six because negative two times negative three is positive six, negative two minus three or plus negative three would be negative five. So that's how we would factor that out. So once we've factored this out, then what we wanna do is kind of think about this, uh, this partial fraction decomposition, which means we're going to take each of these factors as a separate denominator of our fraction. So we're gonna get x minus two as one denominator, x minus three as the other denominator. And then we're just gonna put in these kind of placeholders of A and B as the numerator. And what we're gonna to have to do then is figure out uh, what a and b need to be in order for this uh, partial fraction uh, expansion or decomposition to be the same as this. In other words, what do a and b need to be for this fraction plus this fraction to equal this fraction that we had in the last step? So to do that, what we want to do is think about what steps would we go through to kind of go back the other way and now combine these fractions into one fraction. Well, you would need a common denominator in order to do that. So to get our common denominator, you would just multiply our left fraction here by x minus three over x minus three and multiply our right fraction here by x minus two times x or over x minus two. Basically, you're just multiplying the top and the bottom of each fraction by the denominator of the other fraction. So in this case, x minus two is the denominator over here. We multiply the top and bottom of this one by x minus two. Same thing here, x minus three is the denominator of our right fraction. We multiply the left fraction by x minus three over x minus three. And that's just getting us to a common denominator because if you multiply the top and the bottom of a fraction by the same thing, you're not actually changing its value. 
So we know that if we were to do that and get a times x minus 3 over x minus 2 times x minus 3 plus b times x minus 2 over x minus 3 times x minus 2, now we have the same denominator on both of these fractions x minus 2 times x minus 3, x minus 3 times x minus 2. The order doesn't matter, right? Uh, 5 times 4 is the same as 4 times 5. It doesn't matter what order you put them in. So these denominators are the same. How do we add two fractions with the same denominator? You just add the numerator. So the denominator is going to be x minus 2 times x minus 3. And our numerators are just going to add. So we're going to get a times x minus 3 plus b times x minus 2. So now what we basically have done is we've kind of worked backwards from the first initial kind of partial fraction decomposition. But basically what we know is this fraction right here, this step that we had up here, I mean really all these are equal to each other, but kind of what we want to go back to is that step up there. Because basically right at the step where we factored them out. We know that this integral here is equivalent to this integral down here, which just to write that down here again to make it easier to see, was x minus four on our numerator, and our denominator was exactly what we have down here. So looking at these two things, the only difference is the numerator. We know that if this numerator here is equal to this numerator here, then these two steps would be the same, right? So what we can kind of do is take that as its own separate thing and think about basically a times x minus 3 plus b times x minus 2 needs to equal x minus 4. So this seems kind of weird because basically what we have at this point is one single equation with an unknown a and unknown b. x is a variable, um, obviously also unknown, but it's kind of a little different than what a and b represent in this case. But still, we have three unknown things, x, a, and b, and only one equation. So that's kind of tough because typically to solve for something like this, where we have multiple unknown things, we would need multiple equations relating those things. But we don't have that here. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is basically... We're not really going to treat x as something that we're going to solve for. We're not trying to solve for x. x is a variable that we're going to be integrating with respect to because we have a dx up here. We're really just trying to solve for a and b. Well, what we can do is we can expand out this left side of our equation here. So a times x, a times minus 3, b times x, and then minus 2 times b. And we know this is equal to this. <clears throat> So now what we want to do is we want to look at the x term and the non-x term on each side of our equation. So we have these two terms, right? They both have a constant and an x term. Well, basically, if we look at our left side here, we have a couple of non-x terms, minus 3a, minus 2b. Those don't have x's in them, right? And then we also have, just like we have an x term over here, we also have a couple of x terms over on the left side, a, a plus bx and an ax. So basically, if the things that I put a blue square around are x terms, if our x terms are equal and our non-x terms are equal, then the whole equation must be equal. So basically we can say if ax plus bx equals x, and if minus 3a minus 2b equals negative 4, if these equations are both true, then this equation must be true, and this equation must be true, and this equation up here must be true, giving us, uh, well, then going back a couple steps further, that this equation here is true. This is the one we really care about because this is the one that's giving us uh, us two simpler things to integrate, hopefully. So what we can do is we can basically treat this as uh, a system of equations that we're going to solve. Looking at this left expression, though, what we can do 
basically if the coefficients of x are equal then we should be good so essentially if a plus b or in other words what we could do is think about factoring out an x you get x times a plus b equals x divide both sides by x and we just get a plus b equals one so if a plus b equals one and minus three a minus two b equals minus four then we're going to be good so now we have a system of equations. Now we have two unknowns, A and B, and two equations. So we can actually solve for those. So what we can do is we can um, just solve for either A or B in one equation and plug that into the other equation. So we could minus B over, giving us A equals one minus B. And then we can take that into this equation, giving us uh, negative three times A, which is one minus B. We just found that a equals one minus b over here. So we can replace our a with one minus b minus two b equals negative four. Then we can distribute this negative three times one is negative three. Negative three times negative b is plus three b minus two b equals negative four. Three b minus two b is just b. And then minus three from right here equals minus four plus three to both sides, giving us B equals negative one. Then we can take this B back into this equation over here and get A equals one minus negative one, which is one plus one, which is two. So A equals two, B equals negative one. will make basically all of these equations up here true. So now we can go back to, like I said, this step right here. This is the one we really want. What we know is that the integral of a over x minus 2 plus b over x minus 3 is equivalent to the integral we started with. And even better than that, we just figured out what a and b are, 2 and minus 1. So we should be able to say that the thing we started with that we're trying to solve for this whole time, the integral from 0 to 1 of a over x minus 2 plus b over x minus 3 dx is equivalent to what we started with. Well, like I just said, a we now figured out is 2, so we can replace our a with a 2, and b we just figured out is negative 1, so we can replace our b with a negative 1. So now we know that the thing we started with, this integral way up here at the top, right here, is equivalent to this integral here. So you might be thinking, you know, that seemed like a lot of work to just give us another integral. However, look at what we have now. This integral is actually much easier to, to integrate. We know that the integral of some constant over x plus or minus a constant can basically just be broken down. And I'll actually write it over here so you can kind of keep this as a general formula. Some constant over x plus some other constant with respect to x is just going to be equivalent to um, that constant on top times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus d. And then you would have to have plus some other constant, so plus some other unknown constant. Um, I already use c here, so we don't want to say plus c, but same idea. Basically, you're just going to keep our denominator within the natural log here, keep our numerator as a coefficient of that, and that's that's what the integral is. So in this case, going back over to the problem at hand here, the integral of two over x minus two is just gonna be two times ln of x minus two, and then minus one, or just minus the natural log of the absolute value of x minus three. So this is the integral. Now we've actually integrated. We still have a little more to do. We're not quite done yet, but at this point we have integrated. We have you know, done that integration step of the original function we were given. So that's kind of the reason why we just did all this partial fraction stuff is so that we could accomplish this step right here. Um, and you know, looking back at the original function we had, I don't know how you could possibly you know, guess this as the integral of this original function way up here. That's way too complicated to figure that out. But since we were able to use this partial fraction decomposition, we got it down to these simpler fractions that we were then able to pretty simply 
integrate. So now we can evaluate this integral from zero to one, which basically just means plug in your upper bound, plug in one for X. So we'll take two times natural log X minus two is negative one, but then we take the absolute value of it. So natural log of one minus natural log of one minus three is negative two. But again, we take the absolute value giving us natural log of positive two. So that's what we get from plugging in our upper bound. Then we minus and make sure to put all this around parentheses where you do plug in your upper bound minus plug in your lower bound, put them in parentheses around the whole, you know, the first thing and the second thing, just split, split it in half, basically. Plugging in zero for X, we're gonna get two times natural log of zero minus two is negative two, absolute value is positive two, minus natural log of zero minus three is negative three, absolute value of negative three is positive three. So then we can simplify this a bit. Um, I'm not gonna show you necessarily all the steps to simplifying that, but basically you would distribute the negative sign, combine our like terms, and we would end up with uh, negative three natural log of two plus natural log of three. I'll leave that simplification to you. Um, and we could actually simplify this further using log properties. Um, I'm not going to do that here. If you wanted to get some practice with log properties, uh, that'd be a great, great way to do that. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button down below. Hit the subscribe button and the bell icon when you're down there too. So that way you're notified when I'm going live each week. I do a weekly live stream every Monday night at five o'clock Pacific. Lately, I've been talking a lot about integral calculus and how to apply my integral calculus cheat sheet. If you want to check that out, there is a link down in the description below as well. And if you want to keep learning about integrals, go ahead and click on one of those over there. Hope to see you on Monday night.